Thank you to everyone who has stayed up to this point. I am the last speaker. I'll only keep you here for two, three more hours, no problem. <laughs> uh, this talk is about infrastructure as code. And to kick it off, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about why infrastructure as code matters. I'm going to tell you a little short story. So imagine you're going to start a new project, and you think, I'm going to use Ruby on Rails. It's going to be awesome. You go on the Rails documentation, and it tells you that the way to install Rails is to run gem install Rails. No problem. You run the command, and you get some sort of a weird error. OK, no problem. It's a fresh operating system install. I just need to install make. That'll take a second. App get make. Everything's great. Run gem install Rails, and you get another error. This time, it's about something called no code gearing. What the hell is no code gearing? I have no idea. So you spend a little bit of time on Stack Overflow. Eventually, you figure out, oh, this thing needs some other dependency. So you install that dependency. You run gem install Rails. It's going to work for it. No, no. It still doesn't work. No code gearing is still complaining about God knows what. So at this point, you're getting a little bit upset. Um, I'm judging by the laughs. A few of you have gone through this wonderful experience. I've gone through it, by the way. This is a true story. I've gone through this on every single operating system under the sun. It's just it's a nightmare. OK, so you spend a few more hours on Stack Overflow. You install a dozen random libraries and header files and god knows what else. And eventually, you get it working. Yes. Cool. OK, so you're good to go. You generate your Rails project, you run Rails start, and you get another error. Yeah. Um, this one has, after a load, lots more time on Google, you find out that this one has something to do with Ruby versions and how dare you not use RVM. You should have known better, you poor human being. So eventually, you get it working. You build your app, you write all the code, you check it all in, it looks great. Now you got to deploy it to production. So you go to the AWS console, you deploy an EC2 instance, you SSH to the instance, and you run gem install Rails. You guys know what happens, right? <laughs> you get yet another freaking error. It's a little frustrating. But eventually, eventually, you get it working. You do this in production, you do this in all your boxes and staging and QA. All the developers on your team go through this awesome process. They'll lose hours wondering what the hell is no code here. But it works eventually, and everything's awesome until that happens giant critical Ruby on Rails vulnerability that affects every single install everywhere ever, including the ones in the local box. OK, so now you're panicking, because now all of those installs that took you forever to get right in the first place, now you got to update all of them in a hurry, immediately. So you go to update Rails, and you get an error. And it's about this point that uh, <laughs> you are pretty much ready to give up. So the problem here isn't Rails. I mean, yeah, Rails could be better especially the install process. But there's, there's ways to work around Rails in particular. But the real issue here is that you're installing things by hand. You're SSHing to boxes. You're running commands manually. You're using the AWS console, and you're clicking around on random things, and you're doing this all by hand. And there's a better way to do it, which is infrastructure as code. You're a programmer. Write code. Stop doing these tedious manual tasks. So that's going to be the focus of this talk. Um, I'll go through a real-world example. <coughs> The apps I'm going to deploy are not real world, but the general approach is fairly realistic. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to deploy two microservices, which is, I guess, the absolute bare minimum where you can still call them microservices. Um, basically, a Rails front end and a Sinatra back end. And we're going to use two infrastructure as code technologies to do it. We're going to use Docker, and we're going to use Terraform. Who here has used Docker? And how about Terraform? So I'll go real quick through the Docker intro later, and I'll spend a little more time on Terraform. All right, uh, I'm Yvonne Bergman. <coughs> I'm the founder of a company called Atomic Squirrel, and we help other companies build and scale their infrastructure. And one of the main things we do is help them set up infrastructure as code. Uh, previous lives, I worked at a whole bunch of companies helping them build products and infrastructure. Uh, I'm also the author of a book called Hello Startup, uh, which is a guide to building products, technologies, teams. And if you want a free copy of the book, go on Twitter <laughs> and tweet out the book's website, hello-startup.net, with the hashtag startups. Tomorrow I'm going to go search for that hashtag and that URL, pick a couple random people, and I will send you a free book. So hello-startup.net, with the hashtag startups, 
on Twitter. Okay, final thing, if you want to follow along at home, or if you want to grab the code from this talk later, it's on my homepage, wybrickman.com slash speaking. Uh, it's right at the top. Uh, the code is on my GitHub account. The slides are on SlideShare. I think I posted them on the Facebook group for this uh, uh, conference, so should be able to find it pretty easily. Okay, that's our outline. Uh, it's a lot to get through, so let's get rolling. First thing we'll talk about is microservices. And something that's important to think about is why are microservices such a big thing these days? Why is everyone talking about them? Why do they matter? And the reason is this. Code is the enemy, which is a weird thing to say as a programmer. You probably think your job is to write code, but the reality is the more of it you have, the worse your life gets. Uh, this is a chart from Code Complete, and the column on the left shows the size of projects, lines of code, and the column on the right shows how many bugs per thousand lines of code. Now obviously as a project gets bigger, you expect it to have more bugs, but what this chart shows you is that actually the bugs grow faster than the project. So if you double the size of your code base, you might have four times as many bugs, or eight times as many bugs. By the time you get over half a million lines, you could, the, the bug rates get into one bug for every 10 lines of code. Uh, the reason for this is this. When you're doing programming, when you're doing software development, you're not doing it in a tool, you're not doing it in a chart or on a whiteboard, it's in your head. And the human head is pretty limited. There is only so much stuff you can stuff in your head at one time. You cannot keep half a million lines of code in your head and consider all those interactions. So a lot of programming is just figuring out how can I ignore most of my code safely and then focus on just the one piece that I care about. And that's pretty much what microservices are about. They are one way to accomplish that. The way that they work, I'm sure you guys are all familiar, but when you start out, you usually have some sort of a monolith. Everything runs in a single process and communicates via function calls. When you go to microservices, you move those modules into separate processes, usually on separate servers, they communicate by the messages. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time in this talk talking about the pros and cons of microservices. I will say this, they have a few wonderful advantages. One is isolation. You can focus on one microservice and largely ignore the others. Uh, in others, they're technology agnostic, so you can build them using one technology for one service and a different one for another. And uh, you can scale services individually. But the one thing I want to bring your attention to is they also have a really lot of drawbacks. Uh, operational overhead is massive once you go to a microservice architecture, managing all sorts of deployables and getting them to talk to each other. Performance overhead, so if services help scalability, they actually severely hurt performance because remote calls are really expensive compared to function calls. Uh, you have to deal with different types of I.O. models, error handling, backwards compatibility for public APIs is actually harder. And probably the single most important one that most people forget about is there's a trade-off here. If you work on one microservice and it's very isolated and you're ignoring all the others, well, by picking that design, you've now made it to make you, you've now made it very hard to make changes across all the microservices. Global changes, transactions, referential integrity, you, you're throwing all that away, microservices. So usually you only want to use them when you don't have any other choice. That's usually the right time to go with the microservices when you literally can't scale your team or the actual service itself uh, without splitting them up. Um, if you want to read more about these trade-offs, I wrote a blog post about this. It's called Splitting Up a Code Base into Microservices and Artifacts. If you Google that, um, it goes into a lot more detail. For this talk, though, as I said, two very simple apps. There's a, uh, I don't know how well you guys can read the diagram from back there, but you have a Rails front end here with a load balancer in front of it, and then you have a Sinatra back end with another load balancer in front of it. So two services, as simple as it gets. Uh, I'll try to show you really quick just what the code is, just so you know what we're kind of dealing with here. I'm gonna have to do this with one hand for the time being. Is there a mic stand up? Oh, well, there's a humongous mic stand up. Awesome. <laughs> Is it safe? <laughs> 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 
All right, can you hear me? Sort of. Yes, no. Guys in the back, can you still hear me? All right, cool. So this is probably very hard for you to see. Uh, this is the code that's in my GitHub account for this app, and I'll be able to make the code bigger. I can't really make them any bigger. So this is the entirety of the Sinatra backend. It is literally a Hello World app, one file. The Rails app has a single controller, which makes oops, make that bigger, which makes an HTTP call to the Sinatra backend, pulls out the body, that Hello World text and then just renders it as HTML. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, so about as simple of a microservice example as we can possibly have. Let's jump back into the slides. We will talk a little bit about Docker. <laughs> it's gonna be one of those things. All right, we'll do it one hand. Um, Okay, so Docker, what's the point of Docker? The reason we use Docker is because it allows you to run your code in containers. It sounds like most of you guys use Docker, have at least seen it, so I'll go through this pretty quickly. Easiest way to think of Docker, like a lightweight virtual machine. So if you look at this diagram, this kind of, I'm gonna compare virtual machines and Docker. You start with your hardware, so just an actual laptop or server, that runs an operating system, that runs the virtual machine software. On top of that, it's gonna virtualize the hardware run another operating system on top of that, and then run your apps on top of that. Now the advantage of doing that is you get awesome isolation. Those apps cannot see the host operating system, they can't see each other, and once you've made them work the way you want to, they're gonna work the same way everywhere. But the cost is virtualizing the hardware and running a whole extra operating system, a lot of overhead. CPU overhead, memory, disk space, startup time. The idea behind Docker, the bottom part's the same, but the difference is instead of virtualizing the hardware, we just virtualize user space. And so the apps run on the host operating system, but they can't really see it because the user space, basically the shared memory, the processes, the mount points, network, are all completely isolated. And so you still get isolation, not quite as good as virtual machines, so I wouldn't use this if you have like security requirements, uh, like running someone else's code. But you get very good isolation. It's great for running your own apps and things like microservices. And you get it with basically no CPU, memory, or disk usage overhead, or very, very minimal. And the startup time is incredibly small. So for those that have not seen Docker in action, let's do a real quick demo. Or at least try to. You have to like bend down like a DJ or something. All right. Um, so. That doesn't quite fit. Okay, on my machine, I have an Ubuntu image from Docker. Um, and I'll come back to where those come from. It's somewhere in this list that unfortunately is not really formatting correctly. Uh, but what I can do is I can do docker run, and I can run Ubuntu. And that's it, and it just started. Now those of you who haven't used Docker, you probably just missed what happened. You don't understand that there's anything interesting that just went on. So let's look at that one more time. Let me exit here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you that right now I'm on OS X, this is an Apple computer, and I'm in some random folder. And when I run Docker, I'm now in Ubuntu. Watch this, you name, I'm in Linux. And I see a completely different file system. So the startup time is way under a second. It's almost instantaneous. Where, um, where do these images come from? Why do I have Ubuntu on my machine? So the way that Docker works is you can define these images uh, in code. This is this infrastructure as code concept. So let me show you the image for that Sinatra backend app, which is right here. Make it a little bigger. Can you guys read that? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So this is an image that I'm gonna use to run my Sinatra app. I start with another image as a base image. In this case, this is something called Alpine Linux. Linux. It's five megabytes in size. So this is what I mean by very, very minimal overhead. And then all I'm doing is I'm basically giving a bunch of commands for how to configure this image. Install Ruby, install Sinatra, copy my code, and then when I run this image, run my Sinatra app, and uh, expose a certain port. So, oops. What you can do is go into the Sinatra folder, and you use the docker build command 
or something like that, to actually build your image, to take that Docker file and create an image out of it. It runs really fast because it's cast, but in general, this doesn't take very long. After that, you can run it. So here's the run command for my Sinatra image. It's the same as the Ubuntu one. The only thing is I basically tell it that I want it to expose the port. When I hit enter, my Sinatra assert app is now running. And although I've had many, many Wi-Fi issues and all sorts of connectivity issues in this hotel, in theory, oh, there we go, okay. So there's my Hello World Sinatra app running on my computer. You guys can't see that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have like these blank looks on everyone's face. I'm like, what? It's, like, it's really working, I swear. Okay. okay, so that's a Sinatra app. Um, now here's what's cool is once you've built this Docker image, once you've got it to work and you installed whatever you need to, now you can share it. What you can do is, let's see, where are we here? There we go. Is you can use the Docker push command. And this will push your image to a remote repository. So the same way that with Git, you can do a Git push to push your code to something like GitHub, you can do a Docker push to push your Docker images to Docker Hub. And now, all of your teammates can download these images. And they're gonna run exactly the same way on their computers. They don't have to install Sinatra or Rails or whatever your app is using. It'll just run. Your production servers can download the same images. And they're just gonna run exactly the same way. That whole horrible process with installing <coughs> stuff all day long by hand is basically gone. Now there's another really cool thing here which is uh, other people push images as well. And so Docker has a bunch of community maintained images for most popular technologies, including Rails. Somebody out there figured out how to install Rails, deal with the no code theory issues, go through all of that stuff, and we can just leverage their work. And so if we take a really quick look at the Docker file for the Rails front end, it looks something like that. So we start with Rails, which somebody else already built and tests and maintains. We copy our code, we run bundle install, and then we say, when this image runs, just run my Rails server on port 3000. That's it. No more Noko Geary. No more horrible install processes that never end. And when there's a security hole, somebody else is going to publish a new version with the fixed uh, version of Rails, and they've figured out how to upgrade it without everything blowing up in your face. So this is huge. Now, one last thing I want to show you guys about Docker, which is very, very handy, which is this. Uh, Docker comes with a tool called Docker Compose, which is a way to work with multiple Docker images. And so you have a YAML file, and here I define my two, app, my two microservices. This is the back end, this is the front end. And you basically, for each one, specify the image to run, some ports to expose, you can specify environment variables, all sorts of stuff. And once you've defined them in this file, you can go into your console, and you can do a single command to run your entire stack. So there's my back end, and there's my front end. So now, if I go to the browser, which hopefully you can see, yes, and go to port 3000, that's my front end, up and running. And you'll notice it made a call to the back end, pulled out that hello world, and it's showing it to you now. Now how does this part work? The other cool thing about Docker Compose is it supports links, and what this says is, uh, uh, what Docker's going to do is it's going to add an environment variable to the front end that has the URL of the Sinatra backend. And so instead of hard coding URLs and localhost and dev and something else in another environment, you just look up an environment variable and you have the URL that you need. So it's a very lightweight alternative to a full service discovery mechanism. But it's pretty powerful and it goes a long way. Okay, so advantages and disadvantages of Docker. So creating images, really easy. Sharing images is awesome. And once you get them to work, they run the same way everywhere. Uh, you can run your whole stack in dev using Docker Compose. And the overhead is tiny, so you get really good resource utilization. You can run a ton of images on a laptop, and you can run a whole bunch of Docker containers on your servers as well. There are some downsides. Um, it's Docker itself, not containers, is still relatively new. Um, so you do run into bugs and missing features. And probably the two biggest ones that have bothered me are one, persistent data with Docker is a little shaky. So like running a database in Docker is not ideal. And the second one is passing secrets into containers is kind of a not particularly well solved problem. 
So these are the two, I think, biggest gotchas, but overall, it's, it's a huge win. All right, Terraform, which it sounds like most of you guys have not used, so let's chat a little bit about that. Terraform is a tool for provisioning infrastructure. And uh, what that means is you define what are called Terraform templates, you write code, and you describe declaratively the infrastructure you want. And Terraform is gonna go out and figure out how to create that infrastructure for you efficiently. Now, it supports many different providers. So it's cloud agnostic, it works with AWS and Azure and Google Cloud and DigitalOcean, a bunch of others. And for each of those providers, it supports a bunch of resources. So for AWS, you can create EC2 instances and load balancers and VPCs and all sorts of other things. And you do that in a template. So I'll show you the template. I will try to run it in my AWS account. Again, pending internet issues, it may or may not work. So in that same repo, there's a little Terraform tutorial folder. And in there, there's this file, main.tf. And this is kind of your hello world Terraform template. And uh, what you see here is we're specifying which provider we want to use, which in this case is AWS. And then in the body, you sort of pass parameters. And then we specify resources we want to create. And so in this case, I want to create an EC2 instance. And it's going to have a name, example for talk. And so this is kind of the simplest template you can have. If you go into your terminal, I'll shut that guy down now. Go into the Terraform tutorial folder. And what you can do is to apply these templates, you just run Terraform apply. And if I have internet, I'll actually create an EC2 instance. Let's see. Actually, let me check if I have internet. This is true, I will get to that soon. Okay, I do seem to have internet, or at least I have Google. Mm. Try a different website. Oh, I did not have internet. See, Google lies, Google is not a good test case. All right, give me a second, here we go. Reconnect, let me shut that guy down because that's not gonna do much. Come on. So hopefully, I hear it now, except this guy will not shut down, really. Minor technical difficulties. Oh, there we go. All right, let's try that again. And demo goes will not, oh, there we go. All right, so it's gonna start creating the instance. It takes about a minute. Um, you can actually watch it in your EC2 console. So if I can get my refresh button here, there we go. And you can see there's a new instance spinning up and it's in pending state. And in about a minute, it'll be up and running. So uh, two other things I wanna show you about Terraform. I mean, obviously you can add all sorts of different kinds of resources, but this is the basic structure. But two other things useful to know are, one, it supports variables. So you can specify a variable and give it a name. I call it name. And variables can have a type, they can have a default value, and they can have a description for documentation purposes. So this is name of the EC2 instance. And the way you use variables in your templates is with this curly uh, dollar sign curly brace syntax, and you do var dot name. And so now I'll be able to provide the name as a command line parameter. And so this makes your templates a lot more flexible. Um, the other cool thing that I'll show you here, okay, so it looks like I finished creating that instance is uh, Terraform has, what somebody alluded to, there's a Terraform plan command. And this will show you the changes it's about to make before it actually makes them, which has saved my butt many, many times. So if we run Terraform plan, the first thing you'll notice is it's asking me for the name of that, uh, the value of that variable name, so I'll call it uh, foo. Now it's gonna update its state, and there we go. And so what it's showing me here, which hopefully you can see, is it's not adding or destroying any resources, but it's going to change one. And the change, it sort of shows you a diff. It's going to change that AWS instance, and the tag is going to go from example for talk to the value foo. And so that plan looks good to me. I'll run apply. This time I'll pass the variable actually as a command line parameter, so name equals foo. Let that guy run. And again, if the internet plays along, there we go. So now if we refresh this guy, he is now called foo. Um, the other thing that Terraform supports is dependencies between resources. So 
let me copy and paste this guy in here and uncomment him. So this is another resource. This creates an IP address. And when you create an IP address, you have to tell it what instance to attach the IP address to. And what I'm doing is I'm using that dollar sign curly brace syntax again, but instead of pointing it at a variable, I'm pointing it at another resource, in this case, this EC2 instance. And I'm specifically referencing its ID. And so what happens is Terraform finds all of these dependencies and it builds a dependency graph. And then it applies everything as parallelized as possible. And it knows, for example, in this case, that before it can create the IP address, it has to have the EC2 instance. So it'll create that one first, pull out its ID, and then create the IP using that ID. So we will run the plan command again, make sure everything still looks good. There's our little diff. You can see that it's adding one resource. Nothing's being destroyed or changed. That looks good to me. So now we'll just run the apply command and hopefully we'll have an IP address for our EC2 instance in about a couple seconds, maybe. Maybe not. There we go. Okay, so we'll hop over here and we go to the Elastic IPs and there's my IP address attached to my instance. So variables, references. So that's your lightning quick introduction to Terraform. I'll show you a bunch more Terraform code shortly. Let's chat a little bit find it in here. Chat a little bit about some of the trade-offs with using Terraform before we move on. So, and by the way, I'm just going to stay seated because I just need to keep working on the computer. So pretend I'm being a good speaker and making great eye contact and all of that. Um, the advantages of Terraform are the syntax is actually really nice. If you've used something like CloudFormation and you're used to these JSON documents that scroll for mm -hmm. hours and hours, Terraform is a lot easier to read, even if you've never seen it before. Hopefully that wasn't too difficult to understand. Uh, it also supports very reusable code. So by using variables, uh, you can also specify outputs. You can actually define reusable modules. You can create little reusable, testable pieces of infrastructure as code. And that's actually something that we do at my company is we have these battle-tested canonical pieces of infrastructure that we provide to clients. Uh, the plan command is just awesome. It's so nice knowing what you're about to do before you do it. You can also save a plan and apply exactly what's in the plan file, so there's no chance of breaking something because somebody else updated it. It's cloud agnostic, so you can create a, one resource in AWS and another one in DigitalOcean and actually connect the two. Um, and it's being developed very actively. Downsides are it's really new. Uh, Terraform is a fairly new project that has a lot of bugs and still has quite a few missing features. I still think it's extremely usable and better than many of the other alternatives that are out there, but just be aware, you will almost certainly hit a bug at some point when using Terraform. Uh, and some of the things that are missing are collaboration on Terraform state. So when you create resources, Terraform remembers what it created in these state files, and that way it can update them, delete them, etc. Um, now, it is able to upload those state files automatically to S3 or to console or to various backing stores. What it doesn't provide is any way to lock on those files. And what that means is if you have two people on your team updating those files at the same time, they're going to overwrite each other, uh, unless you put some sort of a process in place. And so there's a bunch of workarounds. <coughs> AsherCorp offers a product called Atlas, which adds locking, but it's really, really expensive. Um, my company is working on an alternative. If anyone's interested, shoot me an email. Um, there's no rollback. So CloudFormation, I don't know if it can roll back everything, or at least some things, but Terraform can't roll back anything. So if things break, you're rolling forward, and it's up to you to figure out how to fix it. And the last one is a little sad, because HashiCorp is actually usually very good with security, but with Terraform, secrets management is not great. If you put a database password in your Terraform templates, which you might to set up a database, um, it'll just store that in plain text in the state file. Now, of course, you can encrypt the state file and store it securely and do all that yourself, but Terraform doesn't do it for you. And so if you're not aware of that and you're checking them into source control, you're basically checking secrets <coughs> into source control, which is not ideal. Okay, last topic for today is ECS. And that's Amazon's EC2 container service. It's a managed service for running your Docker containers on AWS. Um, it's actually really easy to use. The only thing you have to do is get past their terminology. So this is a lightning fast overview. And basically ECS consists of just a few pieces. One is a cluster, 
which is just another way of saying a bunch of EC2 instances. Two is a scheduler, which is going to deploy Docker containers across that cluster. And three are what are called tasks. Tasks are just, think of them as basically your Docker containers. They define the container to run and also what, how much CPU it needs, memory it needs, the port it needs, etc. The only other thing that you need to know is there's also something called an ECS service, which is just a convenient way to manage long running tasks, such as a microservice. So, skip through that stuff. So, we'll take a quick look. I've defined all the Terraform code to deploy those two microservices in that repo. And I'll just show you guys a couple of the highlights. I'm not going to spend uh, too much time on it. Um, so, they're under the Terraform templates folder. Let's make that file a little bit bigger. There we go. Okay, <coughs> so this is the resource that creates a cluster, which is just kind of a label. And what you run in a cluster is a bunch of EC2 instances. Probably the best way to do that is in an auto-scaling group, which will automatically restart any instances that go down. And for this example, I'm just running five instances. Each of those instances, uh, what runs on it is defined by launch configuration. And uh, there's a couple things you have to get right on it, but the main one is each EC2 instance in the cluster needs to run uh, Amazon's ECS agent. It's just an app. Easiest way to do that is they provide an AMI that already has the agent installed. So if you run that AMI, you're more or less good to go. Now, how do you actually define your apps? So I mentioned there was these things called tasks. Oops, here we go. So this is the task definition for the Rails front end microservice. And as you can see, it's basically just a blob of JSON. And you specify the name, you specify what Docker image to run. In this case, I'm using variables for it, uh, which will actually allow me to deploy new versions by just changing a variable. Uh, and then it specifies the resources that service needs. So CPU, memory usage, port numbers, etc. Now, one other thing about services that's kind of handy, if we look at this diagram, is services uh, automatically integrate with load balancers. So when your container comes up, uh, if you're running it in an ECS service, it'll automatically register with the load balancer, and the load balancer will start sending traffic to it. And so the architecture that I'm using here is we have the load balancer for the front end, which is what users talk to, and its tasks will register with it. And then there's another load balancer for the back end, which the front end will talk to to get data from the back end. So if we take a look at these templates, this is the definition of a load balancer, just as an example. This is the one for the front end. And you can specify health checks, and then you specify basically route uh, port 80 on the load balancer to the port that your app is listening on. Uh, but the other thing, ah, and uh, I just forgot to show you, this is the actual service definition. So this is what says, I want you to run a certain task, which is the one I showed you here. I want you to run it in a cluster. That's the cluster I showed you earlier. And I want you to run two of them, or whatever number you want. Um, but also in here, I'm referencing the load balancer I created, and that's how it knows which load balancer to register. Uh, the only other piece that's probably worth showing is for my front end, I'm adding an environment variable here, which contains the IP address of the back end load balancer, which I'm pulling out using uh, Terraform dependencies. So it's nothing's hard coded, you don't have to maintain configuration files full of URLs and port numbers. It's all just maintained for you by Terraform. And this is, again, a lightweight alternative to service discovery. The front end can now use that exact same environment variable to talk to its back end. So this takes a couple minutes to deploy, so I'm not going to do that live, especially with the speed of the internet here. I'll just show you really quick that it is up and running, and then I'll show you what ECS provides in terms of a UI. So this is my auto-scaling group with those five instances. I don't know. Can you guys read that here? Make the font a little bigger in here. And then there's a couple load balancers deployed. There we go. The front end and the back end. Um, one of the cool things you can do in Terraform, if we go into that folder, is you can run the Terraform output commands to see whatever outputs are provided. And so these are the two URLs for my load balancers. So I'll grab the one for the front end. And I can open it in my browser, and there we go. I'm running on uh, EU Central AWS, and this is my front end, and you can see it's able to talk 
to the backend. Uh, this here is the ECS uh, user interface that they provide. It shows you your clusters. This is that example cluster. If you click on it, it inside of the cluster it shows you what services you are running. So <coughs> cut off because of the font size. There we go. So I have my Sinatra backend and I have my Rails frontend. If you click on one of the services, you can see the tasks that are running. And if you remember, I asked it to run two, so it's running two tasks. Uh, there's a panel that shows you the deployment events that have happened, which eventually loads sometimes. Yeah, just imagine it. It basically lists all the deployment events that have happened, if it's struggling, if there's errors, anything of that sort. There's also a tab that shows metrics, which are also struggling to load with the awesome internet connectivity. Um, the metrics are really, really minimal. It's basically just CPU and memory usage across uh, the service. But still, better than nothing. It's, uh, you can also see load balancer connectivity and stuff. Clearly, I've lost all internet access, though. Oh, well. OK. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is uh, using Terraform with ECS. The cool thing about it, which without internet, I can't really demo, but um, I have a bunch of variables defined. One of them is the version of the app that I'm using. And so to deploy a new version, all I would do is run terraform, I'll run the plan command, and then I can do dash var to set one of those variables. So we'll deploy a different version of the backend, or at least try to. And I'll set it to v2. Right now I just know it's set to v1. If you hit enter, we'll see if that works. I'll come back to it and we'll see if that actually out. But you basically just run the Terraform apply command with that variable, and it deploys the new version of your app, and that's really it. Uh, and the way that deployment works is ECS takes care of it for you. It does a rolling deployment. It's not really uh, blue-green deployment. It's closer to a rolling deployment. So trade-offs with ECS. Let me stand up again. Um, it's one of the easiest Docker management solutions to work with. If you're used to something like Mesos or Kubernetes that could take months to set up correctly, this you can get up and running. Just my, my personal experience, sorry. Um, uh, this you can get up and running in like 15 minutes. The only tricky part is, as always, AWS likes to have all of their own terminology, but once you get past those words, it's actually very easy to use. Uh, if you're already on AWS, there's no real extra cost for using ECS pretty nice. I mean, you pay for the EC2 instances, but you'd be paying for those anyway. The scheduler is pluggable. Uh, Auto-scaling groups will restart your instances. Services will restart your tasks if they go down, so you have some resilience. And services automatically register with ELBs, which is pretty nice. Uh, disadvantages. Uh, currently, there's no auto-scaling integration for the actual tasks. Uh, so there's no automatic way to say, if tra traffic goes up, deploy not two instances of my app, but 10. Um, you can build that yourself using Lambda and a few other tools, but it's just not built in. Uh, there's a limitation where each service is tied to exactly one ELB, and so you basically end up running more ELBs, elastic load balancers, than you probably want to, so it costs a little more. The UI, as you saw, it's okay. Uh, the monitoring that's built in is very minimal. You'll have to add some more metrics and log aggregation yourself. Um, while things register with load balancers automatically, there's no automatic way to connect to services. So there's no built-in service discovery. You can sort of work around that, or you can deploy something like console. And finally, there's a limitation where the whole cluster runs in a single subnet, which depending how you set up your subnets could be fine or could, be, could mean that you have to run more than one cluster. Okay, so let me see if that command, that plan command actually ran. Um, it did. So there you go. So you can see it's getting ready to update my service and my task. If I run apply, maybe by the end of the talk, it'll actually deploy. Let me just do that. Okay. So, quick recap. Infrastructure as code is awesome. <laughs> um, once you define things that you basically define all of your infrastructure as code, you have amazing reuse. You can define little reusable modules. You can automate everything. You can version control your infrastructure, so you can go back and forth to an older version if something went wrong. You can code review your infrastructure. You can document your infrastructure. How many of you have worked at a place where if one person left the company, no one would know how to deploy things anymore? Yeah. 
largely this goes away with infrastructure as code, because now the code is the documentation. If it's poorly written, you're still screwed, but at least you have something. It's not in their head. And you can test your infrastructure. We saw the talk before this about testing. Um, we have extensive testing around our infrastructure, separate from the apps that run on it, just the actual infrastructure pieces. And so as we uh, version them and, and upgrade them, we have automated tests that check it. Okay, final thing, if you want to grab that code and take a closer look, it's on yberkman.com slash speaking. Uh, my book talks a lot more about a bunch of technology topics. If you want the free copy, tweet out hello-startup.net with the hashtag startups. And finally, if anybody needs help with DevOps, come say hi. Uh, hang us at the That's it. Thank you very much.